I'm Robert Bringhurst and we are on Quadra Island, British Columbia, near my home. This piece of rock behind me is a chunk of uh, pillow basalt, part of a formation called Harriet Ridge. Uh, I'm going to read to you from a poem called The Ridge. Uh, I'll start somewhere around three quarters of the way through and get a little ways toward the end. It's a fairly long poem by modern standards. And what are hands but subdivided, tamed, and yoked, and harnessed in fire? Hands, leaves, teeth, fins, toes, roots, claws, petals, every gesture yet discovered by intelligence and flesh is fire smoldering in water. And the Milky Way, Orion, and the Horsehead Nebula, the Moon, the Sun, the Music, higher law, we used to say, that you can see in the night sky if you find your way out to where night is still visible. What are they if not the long galactic summer's bloom of fire? and their reflections, spinning round and round each other and unfurling into another cosmic winter, followed, maybe, by the bang of yet another unexplained and inexplicable cosmic spring. But by their light, the oldest thorn corals, bristle cones, sequoias, even aspen groves, or mayflies. Life and mind and day and night are fire, yes, but less and more than fire. Caught and swallowed, slow, subcellular, domesticated fire. The dead who will burn well enough if a big enough fire is built do not have it within them. The dead who so often go on breathing out, but who cannot breathe in ever again, they are fire no longer. And the heart is chopped and parceled fire smoldering in water. The heart is like the hand, the hoof, except it reaches farther. Kitchens and cultures and civilizations like ecosystems and cells have fires inside them. The fire can simmer or it can sleep, but as soon as it's smothered, starved, or set free, or just cranked up too high and left running, that kitchen or culture is done for. Odd, you may say, that we, the only fire-tending animal, can endlessly forget this. But year after year, as you see, what is true becomes truer. Playing with fire is what humanity does. Right now, we burn nine billion cords a year from forests we have never seen, from trees that grew on Earth three million centuries ago. Nine billion cords a year, a million cords per hour all year long. We also burn twice that again, two million cords an hour or more in pressure-cooked and dehydrated corpses. Plants and protozoans, animals and algae from the Mesozoic Sea. We burn, in other words, petroleum and coal. We burn in all some 30 billion cords each year, or 80 million cords per day. If all of that were wood, we would have cut, seasoned, and burned in the last four years every dead and living sapling, tree, and stick in every forest in the world. And is that 
ninety or a hundred times too much, or maybe only eighty-five. We burn that much because we're rich, or think we're rich. We burn that much because we can. But who exactly is that greedy? Thirty billion cords a year is four cords each. Just enough to cook dinner and keep yourself warm if you live without frills in a temperate climate. So all the air-conditioned towers and the bloated V8 pickups and the wellhead flares and smelters bombing raids and battleships and missile strikes and landmines. Notwithstanding, we are wonderfully efficient at inching the blue planet out of the green lap of heaven a billion years before its time. In fact, we burn that much too much because we are that much too many. This means killing a few million will not help, no matter which few million you might choose. Killing six billion would help quite a lot, but which six billion will it be? There are no answers to that question. So we go about our business knowing justice will be done the way it must be by itself, and not by us. We won't decide, we don't know how. We are an errant and metastasizing part of something else we haven't quite learned how to see. There'll be no voting, only doing. Only doing what is possible to do, which is, in this case, Flying blind among the socked-in mountains. Flying, limping, crawling, sitting still and thinking blindly, deftly, mutely. What if we had known what knowledge is? Or what it was when there was knowledge? Remember knowledge? Knowledge flourished in the body and the mind when they were both in steady contact with the living, breathing world. It grew within and in between them, lubricant and glue. It was not a commodity, a crutch, a fabrication, an illusion. It was being with a big bee, sitting on its haunches with its ears cocked watching. A living interaction. You couldn't see it, couldn't touch it. It touched you. It was a landscape in the landscape. A forest in the forest, laced with its own trails. They grew and faded, settled, shifted, did what trails do. And in the process they connected us with tangible reality, each other and ourselves. It's true, not everyone is keen to go out walking in the real. Protagoras, says Socrates, says Plato, spends a lot of time indoors. How else would anyone imagine Homo sapiens the measure of all things? But in Protagoras's time, there was no power-driven, sugar-coated, universal indoors in the indoors that could masquerade as knowledge. There was no global rabbit hole, no faux communal, parody of Plato's cave. Millions didn't flush themselves each day down other people's nightmares. 
Dozens might, but millions didn't shit themselves and hustle other millions to join them in the slaw. In the intangible landscape of knowledge, almost everything is breathing, almost all the time. That kind of breathing is called thinking. How it works is that it takes you by surprise and asks for nothing in return. Staunen ist Denken, as Wittgenstein put it, astonishment is thinking. A sentence that lay hidden in his notebook for more than 30 years. Amery, meanwhile, yanked back day and night to Brandon the chain hanging down and the hook and the horse whip coughed it up the other way around das denken he said ist fast nichts als ein großes erstaunen thinking is practically nothing but utter astonishment Good to hear it said that plainly and twice over and in German. But it's only what the old man told Theaetetus in Plato's head two thousand years before. Astonishment is the philosopher's wound where thinking starts. And that's what it comes back to in the end. The way things gleam when thinking brushes up against them, hum when knowledge sprouts beside them. It's what happens on the ridge, day in, day out, year after year, whether or not humans are up there and whether or not there might be any more. The world is startled by itself amazed to rediscover that it is, dumbfounded to be shown again each day how many facets the breathing diamond has. You cannot touch that either. You can poison it, set fire to it, haul in big machinery and a crew on drugs and wrap around and aviator blindfolds who will happily destroy it. But you can't reach out and fondle it, caress it or seduce it. You are not enough like it that you can touch it. Just enough that it can still touch you. Auch das, this is Amory again, ist eine Art von Entfremdung. This too is a form of estrangement. That is to say, estrangement from estrangement. Estrangement from your kind. You can't go home again to what was never home.